live at the conference and produced by the Sound of Knowledge Incorporated. Uh, my name is Mark Cadrich. I'm the director of security at a company called Connection. And we're going to talk about high speed intrusion detection. Uh, we'll actually talk about uh, intrusion detection in high speed networks and exactly how much it isn't. We're going to start by going over what the problem is, uh, types of different IDS systems, uh, the problem again, apparently, uh, drawbacks in our, our present solutions, testing, some basic assumptions, and some conclusions. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the future. Uh, this was intended to be a one hour presentation and I'm in a one and a half hour slot, so if I talk slow, let me know. Uh, <laughs> what <I'd l> <laughs> yeah, we're going to make this kind of interactive, so if, if I say something that you take issue with, uh, please let me know. We have a roving mic. Uh, this is a fairly hot issue in a lot of places. We're, we've been hearing a lot of things from different IDS vendors and we know that vendors never lie to us. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> for those of you who have been working with networks, present networks have grown uh, at such a rate uh, in the last couple of years that it's been almost impossible to keep up. Uh, it's, I'm sure there's some of us who remember uh, four megabit per second uh, networks and now we're up to full duplex 100 megabit per second networks. Uh, the network I work in, uh, just in one data center, we have five OC48s coming into one lab and uh, trying to deal with intrusion detection in that, envi in that environment is somewhat of a challenge. Uh, basic types of IDS systems, well, we're all familiar with uh, plain old basic hard work. Uh, how many of you folks have poured over log files and have gone over operating systems that you think have been uh, compromised? And isn't that fun? Yeah, I, I really enjoy it. Uh, average life of somebody that we've hired to do that uh, in that position is about six months. Uh, they either go on to do something more exciting, like gardening or something. <laughs> uh, the other types of systems we've seen are host-based intrusion detection systems, and if you've got a large network, you realize how much of a problem that is. Uh, thousand computers at $500 a whack, you go in and talk to your uh, your CFO about doing something like that, and you'll be lucky if you get out with your skin. Uh, to solve that problem, they tried network-based intrusion detection systems, putting a sensor out on the wire, having it listen to the wire. Uh, also, another really effective solution, that is if your 100 megabit network doesn't go above 15 or 20 megabits of utilization. Uh, Log-based intrusion detection systems, we're starting to see those come out, uh, counterpane, Security is, is probably the first in that area to commercialize that kind of an offering. And uh, assurance systems, I call them target monitoring, uh, mostly because once the regular IDS systems fail, somebody is trying to get to something on a computer, and if you watch those targets, it's the old, instead of keeping your eggs in a bunch of baskets, keeping the eggs in one basket and watching that basket. Uh, the plain hard work method. <clears throat> There's freeware out there that you can get. And uh, I'm sure we're all aware of the problems with that. Uh, it's kind of safe hex is what I used to call it. You download something from the network and then you spend a couple of weeks doing a code walk on it, making sure that there aren't any happy fun Easter eggs buried in it for you. Uh, a sniffer, a commercial sniffer isn't a bad way to do it. You can get some real basic pattern matching out of a sniffer. Uh, there's a number of different sniffer programs out there, but they're not cheap either. Uh, NAI is asking, I think, $5,000 a copy for theirs, plus maintenance and plus all the other widgets that you gotta buy. You ever wonder about that? You buy software and they charge you 15% maintenance every year on it. That's just so you get the privilege of having the updates. I always thought that was a very interesting racket. Log analysis, uh, that's the, once again, where you sit down and you pour out over every single, every single line of, of uh, notice that comes from your computers. Uh, SNMP traps, you get, get those picked up and sit down and go through all of those. That's the, that's the one that made me decide that I probably didn't want to be in security. After spending weeks and weeks 
had a, a, a local uh, aerospace company pouring over those logs for one of our government agencies in order to prove to them that the system they told me that I had to use was in fact operating the way they wanted it to work. And these things are very time intensive. Uh, going through one set of logs uh, for one machine that's got heavy logging turned on can take the better part of a day. Now you start multiplying that by hundreds and hundreds of systems and your medical plan and whatever me uh, mental health plan you can get out of it becomes very important. Uh, it is very exciting work. Uh, I don't recommend it to anybody who wants to continue in security. Log aggregation is a pain. The problem is, unless you've got a time base on your system, setting the time on all of your computers, making sure that all of those events are aligned properly is the real issue. You can go down a rat hole in a real quick hurry. When an event pops in at the wrong time, you start following it, it looks suspicious, when in fact it really wasn't. So, our first crack at solving this problem was a host-based intrusion detection system. About 15 years, the government 15 years ago, the government started looking at those, and they had some uh, programs to develop pattern matching, uh, keystroke matching, various things like that. They were looking at intrusion detection more from a physical perspective than they were from a network perspective. They started looking at the operating system to see if it was compromised, and it was one of those things that happened over time. The problem with it is, uh, and I've got customers that complain about this, they come to us and say, we want absolute bulletproof security. So we say, okay, one of the things we're gonna do is we're gonna put a host-based intrusion detection system on your, your machine. They say, great, that's wonderful. And their process that they're running on their machine has got their CPU maxed out completely. So you add host-based intrusion detection and you add the other monitoring stuff that you have in an ASP environment and they start to complain. It's taking up too many CPU cycles because it's very intrusive. You have to insert these things into the stack, they live in the operating system, they become a part of the operating system. Part of the problem we've had with them uh, is that some of the different configurations in the operating system uh, create problems for them. Uh, a good example is NT and our good old friend, Dr. Watson. We run a very popular uh, intrusion detection package on those machines that sounds very similar to IIS, but it isn't. Uh, and we run it on those machines and with our client's application, it, it spooks Dr. Watson about once every five minutes. So our logs fill up and after about a day and a half, their application crashed. So they're paying for this application, this IDS system on their network and on their host and they turned it off. So here you've got an example of, of kind of the problems you run into when you start insinuating code designed to look for strange things inside the operating system. There's a huge amount of regression testing and in my humble opinion, I don't think the IDS vendors are doing a good enough job testing that code. Has anybody else had any kind of experiences with uh, host-based intrusion detection, spooking applications? I'm going to assume I'm the only one. Network-based listens to all the traffic on the segment it's got to live on the target network. If you've got a switch fabric, hi gentlemen, pay your money to this guy here on the. Uh, it's got to live on the target network. If you've got a switched fabric network, that begins to be problematic. The reason for that is simple. Most switches only allow, generally, only allow you to create uh, VLAN and port it out through one port. You can't split up VLANs on those switches. Uh, and of course, since you've got to talk about routing at that point, uh, it begins to defeat the entire purpose of having a switch. And they do have throughput limitations. Uh, I've talked to a, a number of different vendors and they tell me, oh yeah, we can do 50 to 70 megabits a second. All you need is an E450 with two gigabytes of RAM and uh, an 18 gig hard disk drive and that'll be fine. I start looking at what I've got on that network segment and now my IDS solution costs twice as much as all the other machines on that network. It just doesn't seem very scalable. Uh, Log-based stuff, I think we about beat the snot out of that. It's definitely not real time. As a forensics tool, it's something that I think is uh, is absolutely critical. But I think once you, you wind up in court and have to testify in front of a jury, a good lawyer is gonna harp back on that time-based thing. So uh, my 
my caution at that point is if you're actually going to be using your logs and you're going to be doing uh, forensics analysis with them and you're planning on using them for legal purposes, make sure that your ducks are in a row and make sure that your time bases are all set and synchronized. Target monitoring. Uh, a popular application for this is Tripwire. Uh, those of us who've been doing this forever remember having to download Tripwire from MIT. They've now, after 15 years, decided to commercialize it and make some money. Uh, kind of makes you wonder about the marketing department over there. Uh, it, lives on the, it lives on the operating system, or pardon me, it lives on the box. It's basically something that runs through cron or through some other timer. You set it to run once every 10 minutes, once every five minutes. Uh, what we've, we have it doing is we do a complete heavy scan on the box once a day. And at various intervals during the day to meet our SLAs, we have the, the application go back and scan once every 10 or 15 minutes specific files. Things like an NT, we have it watch the, uh, the registry, maybe some web files, some web pages, uh, because the, what we've noticed with all of the attacks that we've had is that hackers tend to go at specific targets. We watch those targets, we get an alert. Uh, some possible solutions. The promised new fast gigabit sensor. Uh, I've had four vendors come to me in no less than the last four months and promise a gigabit IDS engine. I keep asking them, when can I see one? I keep getting things like third quarter of this year. And actually, when they started talking about it, it was the second quarter of this year. And last year, when they were talking about it, it was the first quarter of this year. What we've decided to do is try some application switches. Uh, basically, this is a, a purpose-built switch that takes data, data streams and directs them at IDS sensors. The idea is, is that by doing this, you can tune the IDS engines and the sensors to look for specific types of attack. If the application switch is capable of identifying where those streams are going, you get much higher throughput. Uh, we, the meat of this is actually a test that we did at Connection. We got a number of vendors' products, we put them in our lab, we actually put them on a live network uh, to, see, to see what would happen. Uh, that's kind of surprising. Uh, you could distribute the IDS functionality throughout your network, which basically means taking those IDS sensors, spreading them out in critical parts of your network. Uh, as a consultant, what I used to tell my uh, clients was, okay, you've got to spend $40,000 for this sensor. You're really worried about something in particular. Specifically, you're worried about something. Where is it? Put that sensor there, watch that, and you know, try and save a little bit of money. I'm not seeing the prices come down on this stuff like you would expect. As a matter of fact, uh, I saw a price increase real recently, not just in firewall software, but in IDS software. Somebody asked me today, uh, do you see this being a commodity? Uh, I, don't see, I don't see IDS being a commodity until people realize that it is not a point solution. A lot of the vendors now are saying, buy my IDS product and you will never have to worry about security problems again. And I can't help but think that if they're talking to anybody who knows anything about security, that that's probably not the truest thing to be telling your potential customers. Use faster sensors. I think we covered the E450 approach. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the folks at ISS wouldn't mind having people do that. I know the folks at Sun uh, were real excited about that prospect, especially when I called and asked for a, a price, told them what I was gonna be doing, and they asked me, how many do you want? <coughs> I said, give me a price for 10. Each one of these approaches individually has a drawback. Obviously, some are not fast enough. I mean, the plain simple fact of the matter is that if you've got to use an E450 sitting on a 100 megabit line to get 50% utilization, it just isn't gonna cut it. Uh, some are not real time. Uh, if you're sitting there and you've got people getting into your network, you wanna know as soon as possible. Therefore, log analysis is probably not something that's suitable by itself. Once again, I want to stress the point that individually these solutions may not be appropriate in and of themselves, but as a system, if they're used as a system, they can become very, very effective. Uh, I haven't, in my, my trials and tribulations, I haven't seen an IDS engine yet that works reliably on any system where applications are changing or being updated. 
Uh, I pointed one of my customers and the problem he had with ISS running on his system. Uh, it, if customers do strange things with their code, and we're gonna see more and more of this in the ASP environment. People are writing these applications, they're relying on the network, they're doing things to get performance up, they're taking shortcuts. Host-based IDS engines rely on things being exactly like the operating system manufacturer intended them to be. And the fact of reality is, is that they're not going to. Uh, <clears throat> Our initial test was set up on a special test network that we had. We uh, isolated our network, we got ourselves some equipment, we downloaded some tools and spent the requisite, you know, two and a half to three weeks doing the code walk and building things to make sure we didn't have any surprises. Uh, we went out of our way to make sure that this was, this was not just something that we threw in a lab. We had a test plan. Uh, we had some basic assumptions that we made about the entire environment. We also, uh, wanted to beat the snot out of these things and we called the vendors in. We told them exactly what we were going to be doing. We said, we're gonna take this information, we're gonna write a report and we're gonna tell everybody about it. So it's within your best interest to one, be honest, and two, help us out. We postulated what the possible outcome was gonna be. Uh, we were all very positive at the time, listening to our vendors and seeing some of the results individually that other people were claiming. Uh, and we ran the test a bunch of times just to be sure that we weren't lying to anybody about it. We were looking to meet that 100 megabit full duplex goal. That was the whole purpose of what we were trying to do. We've got a class B in my environment, and that class B, even the class C's are subnetted. So whatever solution I was gonna have to come up with was gonna have to be at 100 megabits because each feed from our machines feeds to a 100 megabit full duplex switch. That feeds to another switch and then eventually to our, our gigabit router that feeds our OC48s. We made the assumption based on the information we got from the good folks at ISS that our sensors would operate in the present configuration at 25 megabits a second. So we got three engines, assuming we, we wanted to swamp them, and we, I'll show you in a, a drawing a little later what that looks like. Uh, to simulate regular traffic, we had noise injection. We didn't want a nice, pristine, clean network. We did do the test with no noise, just to see what kind of, of effect it would have. We wanted to look at the network as the network really was, though. Uh, and we also included a switch to control the streams. Of course, the engines were ISS, they were Solaris on Sparks, uh, half of 256 megabytes of memory and an eight gig drive for each one of them. Uh, we used an application switch from the folks at Top Layer. We were actually included in their alpha test program. Uh, their claim at the time was that they were working with ISS and they were going to be including ISS code in their switch kernel to do some of the uh, some of the initial processing. The goal was to off, offload the, IS, or the ISS sensors in such a way that they could look for strange and mysterious stuff. You know, basic SIN floods, the switch would pick those things up and send, it, send an alert. Uh, we had a Cisco uh, Cat 5000, I believe it was a 5500, as I remember. And of course, Sniffer Pro. We had a Shimidi Packet Blaster. Those things are nice. If you're gonna be doing tests on something like that, those things are wonderful. Gig Ether interfaces, they do packet capture, uh, reformulation of packet streams. It's really an effective test box. Uh, our noise generator, which was basically uh, just a, a sun spark that we had playing captured network traffic, and our target was an NT server. We figured we'd pick on Microsoft. They were having enough problems at the time. Uh, the application switch listened for some basic signatures. It separated based on streams. The idea being that it would look at packet header information and make intelligent determinations as to the source and destination and then route those streams to the proper switches, or pardon me, the proper uh, engines. This was just the first phase of this test. We talked to the folks at top layer and said, okay, I wanna be able to take specific attack signatures and direct them at other boxes, will I be able to do that? They said, not in this revision. Uh, I was supposed to get that revision before this test, unfortunate, or before this show, but unfortunately for uh, stability reasons, they decided to hold off, and as I speak right now, one of my engineers is installing that software on the box back in Sunnyvale. Uh, 
Uh, this was, at this point, we were deep in the beta test program. Uh, the initial alpha test with the switch was just to see if it worked. Could we treat it pretty much like a foundry switch and have it just do load distribution and load balancing? It worked very well doing that. Eight ports for the IDS and one management port. We set it up in a T configuration. And th this is something I, another question I was asked today. Um, the problem, one of the problems with these devices that I've seen, especially in an ASP environment, is reliability. We went out of our way in our design to ensure that there was reliability between our gigabit switches and all, of, or our gigabit routers and our switches. Uh, they're paired up. And I went to my network engineer and said, hey, these guys have this really cool switch. It's got one in port and one out port. And he must have laughed for 15 minutes. He, said, he asked, well, it, you know, does it have redundant power supplies? No. Uh, it, can it be set up in a redundant configuration or a failover configuration? No. He says, why are you bothering me with this? This is the test configuration that we had, uh, real basic. Uh, what you're looking at is through that Cisco switch was one VLAN. And uh, yeah, I, I intentionally didn't include this because I wanted you all to write while I was doing this. So, so you stay awake. Sure, no problem. <clears throat> uh, what we noticed in the initial test, and this was kind of, kind of interesting, and you, would, you spend years and years doing this and you, you still wake up going, wow, I forgot about that. Uh, we captured a bunch of, of attack information. And what we neglected to do in our initial test was characterize that attack information with the IP address of the device we were attacking. So when we played back all our attack information, the top layer switch looked at all of this stuff, said, I don't see that device on my network, and did a, an even distribution. It rebroadcast all of the traffic to all the different switches. We spent, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people did that when they heard that. It's like, boy, that was stupid. So we had to go back and redo our test. What was even more fun was watching ISS engineers and top layer engineers sitting there looking at this, not having the answer, and having one of my technicians come in who's been doing this for about three years and say, well, duh. <laughs> well, we, wrote, we rewrote the, uh, the test information and set it out and reran the tests, and we noticed uh, some pretty interesting things. <coughs> Oh, we had, a, we had a mix of signatures. Uh, we were looking, brain fart. Uh, we were looking for a, s attacks on various applications like SendMail. We were looking for uh, I am absolutely drawn a blank up here right now. Uh, we took basically what we did as I sat down and we took the top 20% of the attack signatures that uh, ISS looked at and we went out and captured those signatures. And for the life of me right now, I am just absolutely drawing a blank. So give me a few minutes. Uh, the question was, did you have the maximum policy set? Did you have 100 signatures set? Did you check for 20? Uh, on, on, on the sensors? W the test program actually, uh, looked at the sensors in different ways. We set the maximum policy first to see what they would do and uh, discovered that the problem with that was is performance. Then we started looking at various, uh, just toning down the policies to look at some of the basic things to see what we could see. What we wound up seeing at that point basically, no matter what we did, including eliminating noise injection, was a maximum throughput on our sparks of 15 and a half megabits a second. At that point, we thought something was wrong. We called ISS. And we said, come in here and help us. Uh, we've asked you for this help. They came out, looked at the box for the initial test, and that's, they said, well, you know, you're looking at uh, a full policy at that point. And ISS looks at hundreds and hundreds of different things. And we said, okay, we'll tune it down then. Well, that didn't help. No matter what we did, uh, and we, I think we threw 108 different attack signatures at it, as I recall. And I'd be more than happy to get you a list of that if you drop off a card later. <clears throat> uh, 
But it was rather promising because what we did realize is that once we got the thing tuned and we actually had the proper IP addresses on the, the attack generator, uh, we noticed that we had an aggregate throughput on the sensors of about 45 megabits a second. Now that's three sparks running on, on a, through a $10,000 application switch. I still have the same, the problem is still the same. No matter what I do, I still gotta take these things and start looking at special networks where I'm gonna put them. Uh, so our, our basic conclusions were is that the combination of IDS engines and switches is actually gonna bear some fruit. Uh, we had the folks at top layer sit down and the folks at ISS sit down and talk to us about it. And that's when the folks at ISS started making some, uh, making some uh, confessions at that point. And they told us something very interesting that really surprised the snot out of me. And I would never have thought I'd heard this come from ISS. They said, you really need to get off the sun box. You need to get on an NT box. <laughs> yeah, I hear people snickering. And you know, surprisingly enough, we ran a test with ISS on an NT box and it's faster. Yeah, it, does anybody else have any experience with that? Because if they do, we're still deep in, in running these tests. They're, pardon? Uh, PCI machines, yeah. Uh, no, not SBUS, we, all of our SBUS stuff has been retired. Yeah, I think we're using them to hold up monitors and cubes and places. <coughs> somebody uh, run this thing around for me? I'm wounded and I'm milking it for all it's worth. Have him repeat the question? The yeah, have him repeat the question. Yeah. <coughs> did, did you want me to repeat what I said? Please. Basically what I said is I have experience with the internet scanner and I've been speaking with them one on one and they're saying that their, their development effort has moved from away from Unix. The, the other thing I know is that the, the IO, IO in a sun isn't is that great compared to for instance an HP. We've used HP machines for, for mail gateways and they perform far better because their IO is much better. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising to hear that. Other than that, I don't, I don't have any more comment. Well, to, to amplify on that, uh, our scanners, when we, do, uh, when we do scans in our other boxes, we run them up through NT. So it runs a lot faster. Uh, so uh, our, next, our next step at this point is to replace those expensive sun boxes with relatively inexpensive NT boxes. The problem now we're looking at is there, you know, Microsoft is marching down the W2K path and we're not seeing anybody doing any development, uh, at least the, the folks at ISS, when I asked them about Win2K, uh, they said, we're working on it, wait till third quarter. I haven't even seen anything in beta yet, so. Internet scanner, Internet, they've updated 6.1 of Internet scanner runs, and the package driver runs pretty well on, on, on Win2000, I'm running it. But oh. I mean, there's still bugs with it, but at least they've come out with, with drivers that run on Windows 2000 for Internet Scanner version 6.1, so. Bugs from ISS? Yeah, I mean, I'm not taking any position either way, right. I'm just reporting what I'm running into. Yeah, and thank you very much. Uh, what we did notice too is even when the system was working, when we upped the noise level, we had the same attack stream, we upped the noise level, we started dropping packets. So, got root, go ahead. <coughs> Um, I, I just recently, like six months ago, deployed a, 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 probably the exact situation you're, you guys w ran into as well. Um, we had, I was deploying some servers that pushed the NASDAQ stock feed in uh, British Columbia, and I chose, uh, unfortunately, chose ISS as the IDS. And um, same exact situation you ran into. I was on the phone for about three days with ISS tech support trying to find out why our Solaris agents were running so dramatically slower than NT boxes, and the technician couldn't figure it out. He told me to shut down all the 
Solaris ones and they would give us a refund on it and uh, said that you know they hadn't yet figured out or could not figure out what the problem was. And so we just basically, like you're talking about, then we were transitioning all of the 10T boxes. So he couldn't, he couldn't for the life of him tell me the reason for that and the reason behind it, so. Well, we, from our testing and our experience, uh, I suspect it has to do, uh, in all fairness to ISS, they, they do try to make a good product and they work very hard. And we had people in our labs just beating their head against the rack trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, my experience with Sun and their, their IP stack, uh, it, I noticed it on the Spark 10. Uh, their inner packet gap timing was, did not meet spec. And we showed them information that said, hey, this is not meeting spec. And they said, oh no, our stuff meets spec. And there's a, there's a number of things inherent in their stack that causes a lot of problems. And I think most of the, if you look at some of the, the uh, smaller firewall vendors, one of the first things they do is they pull out that stack and they put their own stack in. So, oh, one other thing about ISS, and you might find this interesting, I was, I, I learned this today, and I heard a rumor about it, and somebody was kind enough to share this information with me. When they, when they made their internet scan, or when they made their uh, real secure agent for uh, Unix, they ported it to NT. Then they did their development on NT, and then backported it from NT to Solaris. So, I'm willing to bet that somewhere in that transition that there's some problems. Maybe they just need to, if you'll pardon the expression, root it out. Uh, what the future brings, promises of gigabit IDS systems. They're hardware-based, they're ASIC, they promise to be very, very fast. I've seen some things in the lab that uh, promise to get up to OC3 speeds uh, by this time next year. And it, what it allows for us is it allows it, us to place those devices closer to the network edge. Uh, how important is that? Well, if you've got two or three feeds coming into your network, or you know, you're know you a large user of network services, you've got a distributed environment, uh, it means it's going to be a lot more cost effective for you in the long run. We're also gonna see this stuff embedded in switches. Uh, Nokia right now is talking with ISS, they're talking with a number of other vendors at this point uh, in order to get their IDS kernel built into the switches. Uh, ISS shared with me that at, the, at this moment in time, they're planning on doing just that. How well that's going to work, I was not impressed with the Nokia firewall, with Checkpoint Firewall 1 on it, at least not from a, a price performance perspective. And I guess we can just uh, forget about routers. The other thing is, is when these guys come in and they make these claims, uh, ask them to show you some test data. I've been unsuccessful in getting any true unbiased data from any of these vendors. <laughs> More chuckles. Somebody else has asked for it, I can tell. Uh, anybody has any questions, uh, any comments, or anything you'd like to discuss about this, uh, feel free to speak up now. I've got a, a microphone monkey here, so. testing on Solaris and testing on NT. My question is, had you tried testing, or could it, could, could it be done to test on Solaris on an x86 platform, and seeing if it's more hardware dependent or more of the operating system that's slowing it down? That's an interesting, an interesting question that actually came up in our discussions. Uh, unfortunately, what we have in our environment is we have to take standard boxes that we're using, uh, and that was not one of the standard boxes. Uh, we opted just to go straight to NT in order to save time. Uh, maybe it's something we'll do in the future, but getting from point A to point B and getting a solution quickly meant using something off the rack. So the short answer is no, we didn't, we didn't do that to see if it was hardware dependent. Um, actually, we, we tried the same thing. We moved to Ultra 420Rs and we packed about two gigs of RAM into each one and uh, just totally spazzed the systems out and we still notice no increase, dramatic increase in speed at which they should, should be and were marketed as being able to run at. Yeah, we went from 256 megabytes to 500 megabytes and noticed like a 1% increase in performance. It was not very dramatic at all. Ooh, more questions. Eating up the time, I like that. I just had a comment. Um, I've been working with intrusion detection for a, for a while, and um, 
the even if vendors do replace the stack on NT, the NDIS infrastructure that's built into Windows NT will never be able to keep up with the speeds that you know the high speed types of service providers uh, want to provide. I, the only thing I see that's going to be a solution is uh, some type of Linux-based solution uh, or on some other variation of Unix. The Indus is just way too, you know, cumbersome. Slow. Yeah. Yeah. Open up a can of worms. I just wanted to comment quick. I've done some testing on output uh, using LibNet. Uh, so this is not IDS stuff, but this is just spewing packets. Uh, on a Ultra 60, I can get about 20,000 packets per second on a Spark, whereas on a Linux box, I can get 30 to 40, so uh, it might Repeat be. Repeat that. Say that again, please. Just uh, spewing packets uh, out with LibNet. Uh, on a Spark uh, Ultra 60, I can get about 20,000 packets per second, whereas with a Linux box, it's it comes in, you know, on a 500 megahertz P3, it's like, 30 to 40,000 packets per second. So you really, the hardware does make a big difference. Thanks. Oh, well, there's a guy in the back corner over here, Rob. Just a comment on the uh, N2K Thanks. Um, did, did you guys uh, check um, on the Solaris boxes, did you check where the actual bottlenecks were happening, whether you, uh, you were like memory bound or CPU bound or IO bound uh, as the packets were coming in? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, we went, it, what we found out was is that uh, looking at this, the box itself, that it was the actual application, the IDS application that was holding up the traffic. Uh, we thought, okay, we'll give it more memory. It didn't help. Uh, we even throttled down the packets. I mean, if I've got 25 megabits a second on a, a line on a box that I know that can handle a web application at 100 megabits a second, it's not I.O. bound. <clears throat> Do you mind? Come on, don't be shy. Just don't hit me in the sore arm. So, no, that's okay. I have two, two, should I stand up? I have two quick comments. Um, <coughs> The first comment is, did you try running Snort? S say what? Try running Snort. We're getting way better performance out of Snort than, than 25, 30, 40 megabit. I mean. uh, no, I didn't. Uh, the, one, of the, one of the problems that I've got in this environment is uh, having to use uh, commercial off-the-shelf software. Uh, because basically what we're doing is we're reselling this as a service and part of our due diligence. Uh, I'm not familiar with Snort. Uh, there were a number of other packets. Black Ice was one of them that came up. Uh, all of these, from what I've heard from people out on the street, uh, these, are good pa these are good products. It's just, uh, from a corporate perspective, I have to go with the big boys before I start moving my way down the food chain. Well, the reason I mentioned Snort was sometimes we have clients run Snort and then compare that to ISS and then they can use some freeware tool as ammunition and say, well, duh, it's obviously, this is achievable. Yeah. So. How, well, how fast were you, what kind of speeds were you getting with it? Um, it depends on the platform. I could ask the author. Well. <laughs> Boy, and I thought I had a shameless plug in here. <laughs> um, the, uh, I get, I get various statistics. I actually, uh, I've run up um, some tests where I've done some bandwidth testing by actually uh, hooking it up to a switch and then aggregating a lot of data through the switch up to about 350 megabits a second. At 350 megabits a second with, uh, with just a few rules loaded, with like five rules loaded, uh, you'll see 50% packet loss. At 100 megabits a second, you'll see uh, usually zero to 1% packet loss. I know that uh, Dominique Brzezinski was telling me they were running it uh, at Amazon on a steady uh, 80 megabit a second uh, saturated network and uh, with about 200 rules loaded, he was seeing around 0.04% uh, packet loss. So you get packet loss, but Snort is kind of is kind of uh, lightweight. It doesn't do some things. Well, it does more than ISS does, but uh, it doesn't do some of the things that uh, ISS um, has a potential to do because they have, you know, that's Rob, get that guy's card, will you? <coughs>
There was somebody over here who had a question. Can I make one other quick comment? Just qu I'm not going to plug Snort again. <laughs> <laughs> Although Snort rules, everyone. <laughs> the, the other comment I had was, don't you think as the space gets more and more evolved and everyone uh, sort of matures, uh, or certainly the IDS uh, industry matures more, the people are going to start moving to more dedicated hardware, hardware platforms, uh, more ASIC-based systems, more uh, dedicated systems, so that they have not not Windows or Solaris or anything like that as the bottleneck, but more a proprietary operating system uh, that's sole function in life is simply to pass packets and do detection. Uh, the answer to that question is yes. I'm actually seeing that in a number of different arenas. Uh, the first one being firewalls. Right. Uh, the, the problem with it, uh, being in a hardware solution uh, is that if you have a large network and it's a switch fabric network, uh, getting a, an aggregation point to plug your IDS sensor into is, can be a real problem. Uh, if you, as networks move from routed to switch, this is going to become more and more prevalent. So they're going to have to drop the price of this thing to almost make it a commodity to where it becomes affordable. You start looking at how networks are segmented now, and you're seeing finance segmented off from HR, from legal, from the development group, from the security group. I mean, it, a lot of organizations have five and six different networks. And coming out and saying, I've got to spend $100,000 this year in hardware plus yearly maintenance you know, in perpetuity, uh, I, you know, financial people just roll up in a ball and turn funny colors. So, you know, when you start looking at, f you know, $50 a seat from a software solution, and you're, they're coming in and making claims that are saying, well, we're trading 5% performance for this software, for this software to run in your machine, it, it becomes a much more cost-effective approach. I'm not saying it's a better approach. It's not definitely an effective approach because what we're seeing is, is that the software just doesn't keep up. Did that answer that? Yeah. Go How ahead. You doing? Not way. to uh, bash ISS or Mac, uh, Microsoft. Uh, oh, go ahead. Everybody else is. Yeah. I, I just got to, I think the title of this, uh, I think the title of this, uh, I guess this public speaking here was High Speed Networks for Intrusion Detection. So I guess I have to understand why we're why are we talking about platforms uh, such as Microsoft or what about intrusion detection like Real Secure? Um, I, I think that everyone's aware that Real Secure is not a viable solution for high-speed networks. So again, I was I was I guess the question is is why uh, why was the testing being done with Real Secure uh, basically in your presentation here? Because these were the tools when we started this test that we had to use. Okay. Uh, there aren't. There are no major manufacturers of anything mm. that does high-speed intrusion detection. I see a guy waving a card here, mm. so I get a feeling I'm going to get another shameless plug. Yeah, actually. Uh, um, uh, but that's, you know, and the purpose of these things is to bring this information out in the open. Uh, once again, from a corporate perspective, as an ASP, or we enable ASPs. We have to be able to make claims and guarantees and be able to prove them. Mm. Uh, two and three man companies that are developing technology is uh, these guys are on the cutting edge. We look at these things, we see them, but when we make decisions about deployment, it has more to do with uh, what kind of due diligence can we do with these individuals and, and what kind of financial recovery can be made if the system fails. So there's, there's a lot besides the technology. So what we looked at was can we take some of our existing tools, can we take some of the existing equipment and some cutting edge technology, combine it, and come up with a solution that meets our requirements? Sometimes the test, the answer to the test is no. And that's what I'm saying right now. Based on what I've seen, uh, the answer, there is no real answer for intrusion detection in high speed networks as of this time. So that's the disappointing news. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to take a visit to intrusion.com and uh, to take a download of our software. I think you'll uh, not to take a vendor pitch. I've been trying to bite my tongue. Uh, Go ahead, take the I, vendor pitch. These people uh, are here to learn. But I, I think that, uh, yeah, mm. I've got plenty of cards. Uh, just go to intrusion.com and uh, definitely take a, a demo of the software. But, you know, we ran into the same thing, seeing 32 megabit uh, per second on real secure, being end users and engineers as this whole table lined up. Uh, been working on technology for a long time. 
and in the IDS market, so, and uh, definitely. This isn't the whole company here, though, is it? Uh, no, uh, okay, we're about good. 290 employees publicly traded, so there's good. a lot of companies out there that may not, and there's, you know, you heard from other vendors or other speakers here earlier today that develop intrusion detection, which have uh, pretty unique systems, but I know that there's three or four systems out there that are a lot faster and probably better solutions than real secure, so I guess that's why I was trying to understand. We're talking about high-speed networks, and really there's probably two or three viable solutions a lot better than real secure today, and I guess that's what basically I was wanting to speak for is uh, to understand why real secure was even uh, mentioned uh, for high-speed networks. Thanks. That's what I had. Can you add the mic to the... the yeah, don't worry, Somebody this is not a plug. I'd just like to make a comment about comparisons of different systems. Uh, you know, when you're talking about things like Snort versus Real Secure versus this product versus the other product, uh, detection speed is not the only issue. You also have to consider accuracy and the type of processing that's occurring. A lot of these systems are simply, you know, network grep based systems which are scanning for specific signatures. These systems can be easily bypassed. So really, you have to make a trade-off decision as far as what's more important to you as a security manager, you know, high-speed detection or accuracy or a combination of both. So that's really something that should be weighed as well. And that's one of the things we did look at was accuracy. In a canned environment where you know what, what the actual attacks are going to be, you expect the system to, to pick up all the attacks. In reality, it didn't. Uh, sometimes it did not see some of the attacks. At some points it misreported attacks. So there is an accuracy issue, but it, it's an accuracy issue that I've seen with virtually all of the IDS engines. We, we tested NFR, similar problems with it. It was much faster. And, and as a matter of fact, in the next iteration of this test, there will be NFR engines in parallel to, to look at these things. So we're doing our best to get as much as we can, but like all the other people out here, we've got uh, manpower limit, or pardon me, personnel limitations. Still working on that PC thing. Uh, there was another question? Yeah, Mark, uh, um, I was wondering. I don't know you, Russ, do I? Okay. Okay. I was wondering uh, your comments or thoughts on uh, Cisco's move to try to move the IDS to the, uh, to the switch, to the back plane, get it closer to the, uh, to the bus and, and where you thought that might be headed? If, if it's Cisco, my experience with Cisco is that it's headed straight to the marketing department. <laughs> uh, if you had said any other vendor, I probably would have given it a, a little bit more credibility. But what Cisco tends to do is they'll go out and buy somebody and buy some technology and try and plug it in. Uh, a good example is TCP intercept. One of, one of our tests uh, failed abysmally was turning TCP intercept on on one of the routers. And one of the things we noticed was the minute you do that, you pop out of the silicon switch and you're back in the processor again. Performance, performance goes down to 25% of the capability of the box. Now, I haven't seen the architecture, I've heard rumors about it, but if it's, if it's a blade that plugs in and it's ASIC based and it doesn't do anything to interfere with the traffic and doesn't actually touch the packets, there may be a chance, and, oh, and if it doesn't make it to the marketing department first, <laughs> uh, there may be a chance that it, this is a credible product, but I haven't seen anything yet. And I, I, I suspect this is going to be where it's going to be. It's going to be an infrastructure element uh, eventually. Oh, really? Get a card from him too, Rob. Uh, any other comments? Yeah, I got, a, I got a question. Um, where, where? Oh, here. the guy waving his hand, hey. yeah. Um, the, uh, have you, uh, uh, yeah. I, I have a problem with a, a really large network I need to be doing scanning on, and. Um, yeah, scanning or IDS? Uh, IDS, uh, we have, uh, at the moment, five E4, uh, Five OC3 is running in parallel and in significant growth over the near term. Um, the uh, one of the thing, concepts I was experimenting with was uh, limiting the uh, one of the concepts I was experimenting with was limiting the IDS scan to the attacks which had a capability of being successful, um, using some sort of uh, load balancing and restricting it to certain ports. Uh, and, and, uh, in order to try to reduce the load of the scanned data. Uh, That's basically what we were doing here. We were tuning 
the sensors themselves were just looking at that top 20% of attacks after a while. Uh, that was the only way we could get the, the performance up to 16 and a half megabits. Uh, that's a viable alternative, but once again, as this gentleman pointed out here, accuracy becomes an issue. Uh, how do you know when one, when one attack's going to be successful and when one's not? If it's not, if it's a known unsuccessful attack, my question would be, why are you even wasting processor time looking for it? Yeah, well, the question I had was if you have, uh, what if you limit it down to a single attack stream you're looking for? I mean, that would be the best possible case, right? Yeah. Um, what kind of performance do you think you could get from this art kind of architecture with that kind of extreme limiting? I think just on a hunch, based on what we've seen here, uh, it's almost like the old MassPAR question with processors. Uh, if one processor is doing one thing and one thing only, and you, each one was specialized, that eventually performance would increase. It's an N plus one performance increase. I've got one sensor looking at one box, one sensor Look, one sensor on one box looking at one attack, another box looking for something else. The problem then becomes one of cost. Uh, I can't go into my finance department and ask for a buttload of money every, every six months because there's a new attack signature out. Because if you're deploying 15 of these, that means that every time a new attack signature comes out, you've got to get a new processor for each one of those lines. It becomes impractical. The management problem then becomes an issue too. How do you deal with configuration elements? Because my experience is, is that most security breaches, I'm not talking about intrusion detection processes, but the breaches come from the fact that systems are misconfigured and there's been poor management on them. Thanks for coming by. Uh, how are we on time? Is anybody watching? You are. Oh, you have a question. Uh, I think it ends at 410. What time is it? 340. <laughs> <laughs> it's time perfect for my one hour slot. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you're going to publish. Are you actually going to put some of the numbers together, put together a white paper, or just throw some info up on Connections web pages, any of that kind of info? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, it's funny you should ask. I didn't give her a dollar to ask that question either. Uh, I talked with the folks at uh, our internal IT department. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing. We're, we've got a security link that we're going to be publishing some of the things that we're doing internal on our network. And hopefully it'll be including uh, some new vendors, since it seems like I might have made some new friends here today, or new enemies, depending upon how they view this. But uh, if there's no other questions and nobody has any other comments, I'm going to turn you loose. Uh, I tried to suck up an hour and a half. My apologies. Pardon? Oh, uh, send me an email. Yeah, anybody who wants the information, just send me an email. <laughs>